Hello. So in this particular episode, I'm going to talk about sign stimuli and super normal stimuli. So in the last episode, I talked about uh, reflexes, and uh, the reflexes were considered by Descartes to be behavioral reflections of the stimulus that triggered the behavior, uh, which means that in order to understand elicited behavior of this sort, uh, we should we need to figure out exactly what the eliciting stimulus is. And the eliciting stimulus is not always obvious. So uh, um, in my laboratory over a period of about 25 years, uh, we've been uh, doing a lot of uh, uh, studies of uh, uh, the sexual interest that uh, male uh, quail show for female quail. <laughs> okay, So uh, what we're looking at is the male's interest in a female. And uh, the question, and you know, males uh, as not just quail. <laughs> Fortunately, this is not limited to quail, but males are often very much interested in females. But uh, if you're thinking about this from a, a standpoint of elicited behavior, where the, the interest of the male is elicited by the female, uh, an obvious question is, well, what are the cues? What are the components that, uh, of the stimuli that females uh, emit that, that are of interest? And so I'm gonna sh we're going to review a little bit of uh, research along these lines. And if uh, we, uh, we may see the first slide, uh, this shows the basic uh, experimental setup. Uh, you have a male bird uh, in a rather large arena, and there is a window on the left side, and there is a female on the other side. And uh, if there is a female on the other side, particularly if he has had a chance to um, uh, mate with her on a prior occasion or mate with any, uh, any female on a prior occasion, then the male is going to be very interested in just looking through the window, looking at the female. He's going to do this all day long. And so the question is, what about the female bird on the other side makes her a female? And so the next slide shows you the results of a series of experiments that are, you know, I'm showing you these experiments because I'm, you know, I'm familiar with them. We did them in my lab, uh, but there's research like this uh, uh, done uh, with all kinds of species and uh, all kinds of laboratories around the world for many years. And uh, what we've done here is to, uh, vary what's on the other side of the window and look at uh, uh, how much time the male spends near the window. And uh, on the first uh, uh, panel, there's a normal female on the other side and the male spends about 90% of his time by the window. If there's an empty cage on the other side, his uh, interest in the window drops. If there's another male on the other side, his interest is drops. But the next next panel is pretty interesting because here we put uh, put a taxidermically prepared female on the other side. So now now it's a taxidermic female on the other side of the window. So she doesn't move like a, a live bird. She doesn't smell like a live bird. She doesn't vocalize like a live bird. Uh, and uh, we weren't very good in our ta taxidermy, so she's pretty ugly in terms. Of, she doesn't. She's not a very pretty female. Uh, nevertheless, the male is over there all the time. If you put a taxidermic male over there, uh, then he's not very interested. So what this tells us that uh, just the visual features of the female are uh, what makes her attractive. It's not her cause. It's not her shape. It's not her movements. It's uh, just the visual features. Uh, in the next slide, we kind of took those visual features and analyzed them in terms of components. So uh, here uh, we're looking at uh, 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 the, the bar and line across the top is the level of interest in a taxidermic female. And then look at the second bar over. In the second bar over, uh, we just show the head and neck of a female and uh, uh, their the model that we use this is uh, on the bottom right hand part of the slide. So what you have is, is the head and neck of a female on a dowel. 
Uh, so that's a very unnatural uh, position. Uh, nevertheless, the, the male responds to this head and neck in the same manner that he responds to a live female. <laughs> Uh, he's not as interested in head and neck of a, uh, of a male. He's not interested in a female that has a paper bag put on to obscure her head and neck. <laughs> or, and if you turn the head and neck upside down, he's not interested, and so on. So what this kind of research, and there's been lots of research of this sort, what this kind of research uh, has done is to identify the critical sign stimulus for eliciting a piece of uh, a piece of behavior. So a sign stimulus is that particular feature of a complex situation. Uh, this is a social situation involving male and female birds uh, comp and that involves olfactory, auditory, movement cues, all kinds of things none of which are relevant. It's just the visual features. And it's just the visual features of the head and neck, not their backside. Uh, so that's the sign stimulus for this uh, social proximity response. And every uh, instance of instinctive uh, behavior, if you will, uh, is elicited by a critical sign stimulus. Uh, in the last uh, episode, we talked about the suckling behavior of human infants. Uh, I found this uh, photo next to photograph uh, somewhere and I wish I knew where I found it. Uh, but unfortunately, I've forgotten where I found it. But it's really striking. You, you have a, bro a bronze bust of a, of a, of a female uh, showing the breast area. And this baby goes for the nipple <laughs> of this statue. So why is that incredible? Well, the, it's incredible to me because this bronze statue has very little of the natural features of a of of a uh, of a breast. It, it it's not warm, it's not soft, it's missing the olfactory features. Uh, it uh, it's hard. <laughs> it has the, maybe the wrong color. Uh, it's certainly the wrong texture. Uh, nevertheless, the baby goes for the nipple, showing you that there's something about the shape and the visual features that are all sufficient as a sign stimulus for eliciting suckling behavior in infants. Now, as I mentioned, uh, these kinds of experiments have been done in all kinds of species, and including human species. Human species are, are uh, notorious for... Uh, uh, the existence of these sign stimuli. So the, the critical uh, characteristic of a sign stimulus is that it doesn't look anything like the real thing. Nevertheless, it elicits the full richness of behavior that the real stimulus does. So if we look at the next slide, this, uh, this slide shows a series of emojis. <laughs> and uh, emojis... Uh, uh, work. We use them all the time, right? The, the first one was the smiley face, right? Does the smiley face look like someone who is smiling? Well, I haven't seen anybody look like that. It's perfectly round. Have you ever seen anybody with a perfectly round head? <laughs> it's got eyes that no one has eyes like that. And they're not placed perfectly symmetrically like that. And no one has a mouth like that. So what the emoji does is it, it replicates the sign stimulus features of an agreeable smiling individual. And it does so, so effectively that when we get a smiley face, you know, if you're texting your friend or something and they send you back a smiley face, you actually feel better. <laughs> I mean, it elicits the correct emotions. And now, of course, after the smiley face has been so successful, now we got emojis for all kinds of stuff. Look at this one about being worried. <laughs> I mean, none of these look like and the face of any individual that I know. Okay, so once you've identified the sign stimulus, then uh, uh, what that enables you to do is to exaggerate it. And so the next slide shows you uh, the results of a uh, 
a series of uh, exper classic experiments that, done by the uh, ethologist uh, uh, Barons uh, on the uh, incubation behavior of the herring gull. Herring gulls will sit on their eggs to incubate them, and how vigorously they uh, incubate the egg is indicated by modal model value on the, on the bottom axis. As you move to the right, it elicits more incubation behavior. And uh, a normal egg is brown, and it's about in the middle of this, uh, this slide. Now, if you look at R, row R, this is a series of test eggs uh, that uh, were uh, given to incubating herring gulls to look to see how much incubation behavior they elicited. And a normal egg elicits quite a bit of incubation. But if you make the egg bigger, you get more incubation. If you make it even bigger, you get even more incubation. So this elicited response can <clears throat> become exaggerated if you take the sign stimulus feature and exaggerate it. And so you get way more elicited behavior than you would under normal circumstances. And that's, called, that's why we call this a super normal stimulus. Now, uh, this super normal stimulus was originally identified uh, with animal experiments of this sort. Uh, and you might think, well, you know, what does that have to do with human behavior? It turns out that most highly successful commercial products have taken a sign stimulus and supersized it. <laughs> uh, and uh, this is very much the case in the food industry. So uh, there is a, uh, an author by the name of uh, Deidre Barrett, who took a course exactly like yours <laughs> at uh, Columbia University some years ago, where she learned about sign stimuli. And she's, she thought to herself, hey, isn't this kind of like what McDonald's is doing? And so she published a couple of books, which essentially deal with how uh, the food industry uh, has uh, created supernormal stimuli. And the next slide shows you the titles of these books. The first one was Wasteland, was published in 2007, in which uh, she talked about the food industry. Now, the food industry is highly successful in identifying what is the sign stimulus for eliciting pleasure in an ingestion. You know, um, what are the cues that make food really pleasant to eat? Well, it turns out they only have to have two features. Uh, one is they have to be sweet and they have to have a lot of fat. <laughs> and uh, so if you take cardboard and you make it sweet and then you spread a bunch of butter on it, people are going to eat cardboard, <laughs> which is kind of what, what some commercial foods are like. But McDonald's has taken this uh, to extremes uh, to the extent that they actually put sugar in the buns that are used with their hamburgers. And why do kids just love McDonald's French fries? Because it has more fat than anybody else's French fries. Why do kids just love uh, fried chicken. It's not the chicken they love. It's the crust and the, fr the stuff that it's fried in and so forth. And it's an example of creating a super normal stimulus. And it's kind of fun to think about other areas of human activity where uh, commercial uh, uh, in industries have uh, taken advantage of science stimuli that control human behavior and, uh, and supersize them. The iPhone has a lot of that, those features built into it, which makes, I mean, one of the things that's remarkable about kids is they're not gonna give up their tablet. Why don't they give up their tablet? <laughs> Why are they so hooked on their tablet? Because uh, uh, programmers have found science stimuli that elicit interest and they've maximized these. They're supersized them. They create super normal stimulus. So uh, this kind of uh, stimulus analysis 
and the creation of supernormal stimuli is not limited to animal behavior. That's my lesson for today. Take care. Thanks.